everyone welcome back to the career medis podcast this is your host nisar ahmed this is episode 111 of the career medis podcast and this particular episode is part of the day in the life of series and uh, if you, this is the first episode you're listening or if you're joining us for the first time what i have done in each of these episodes i conduct interviews with individuals from a particular career or a particular job and typically our guests share their individual experiences how they got started in that particular field where they stand today uh, some of the benefits some of the challenges some of the struggles and some advice for the audience as well and for today's episode i'm speaking with someone who is an accomplished front end developer and our guest's name is joe casabona we'll find out more about front end development and also about our guest as we go along but first hey joe welcome to the podcast hey thanks for having me i appreciate being able to come on the show i'm sure the audience and myself will love to learn more about you and your journey but you know maybe you can help i think it's better you explain this better than i do for those of us who are not familiar with what a front end developer does could you give a very high level overview yeah absolutely so when i first started making websites you were just a web developer or a web designer you would basically do everything yourself as the web has evolved being a web developer has kind of been not siloed off but kind of divided up into different areas and so i'm a front end developer which means i focus on building out what the user sees when they go to a website so if you visit a website you see the design you see some of the cool javascript effects or or some of the interactions with the forms that's generally what i do and a front end developer will work with html css possibly php and javascript and the flip side of that is a back end developer who works on kind of the under the hood stuff so a good analogy would be a car i'm the guy who details the car maybe you know puts the finishing paint on and stuff like that the back end developer is the guy who actually works on the motor so yeah thanks for giving the uh, the rundown and that's a great analogy so anyone can get that so the next question obviously i'd love to learn about your journey you know how you got started why you chose this particular field they'll give the audience some insight on your journey. Yeah, absolutely. So, I was kind of always a, a techie person, I guess, to give you a frame of reference. I'm 33 years old, so I got into computers in the mid to late 90s, and I was big enough like fixing computers and and working with the hardware side of things, but I really understood the internet. We had the internet since like 1998 in our house, which is kind of early. based on other people I've talked to and we also had a CD burner really early on so I would like make mix CDs for people I would sell them for 5 bucks a pop so I got a reputation as being good with computers somebody at my church on the parish council came to me and they said Joe we know you're good with computers can you make us a website and I didn't know how to do that so I was like oh I don't know like I've never made a website before I'm like 15 years old at this point so I'm like I don't really know and they said we'll pay you and i was like oh yeah i will make you a website so <laughs> my first website was a paid gig i got a copy of microsoft front page 2002 or something like that and i made a website using that and i really enjoyed it cuz it it allowed me to flex my kind of creative brain but also my logical brain kind of laying out everything and so after that i was like well i'm going to let my friends and family know that I'm making websites now and I got in at the right point pretty much because it was still the early 2000s a lot of people didn't have websites and a lot of my friends parents were business owners or new business owners and so I was able to make uh, you know a good amount of money selling websites for between 200 and 500 dollars a pop so what i'm hearing this is sort of an accidental career this is not something that you had planned as when you were young it just happened and you just jumped on it Yeah, so I I really liked computers and I knew I wanted to do something with computers. I feel like every boy who was in my position 
in the early 2000s wanted to make video games. Like, that's why they went to college. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of my thought. But then I started making websites, and I, I loved it. So that was, that was the path I decided to take, and I still do it to this day. So what does your typical day-to-day -day look like? When I'm making a website, so I guess I should uh, maybe clarify here that I'm as well as a web developer, I'm also an educator and a podcaster. And so I divide my days up like that. I'll do a lot of educational content some days. I'll do my podcast other days. But when I'm making a website, generally, I am trying to make sure I know the latest because this is a fast changing field. I'm looking for clients and then I'm, I'm planning out a website. So maybe the best thing to do as far as my day to day goes is I, I wake up, I get some coffee, I check my email, uh, and I read a couple of blogs just to see kind of what's going on, put some stuff aside for my newsletter and my educational content. And then I'll boot up my code editor, and I'll figure out what project based on my project management software I should be working on today based on the timeline. And I use Freedcamp for my project manager. So in there, I'll have some projects broken up by task. I try to break up my website projects pretty granularly so that I can work on one to two hour tasks at a time. I find that that just makes it easy to, to check the boxes off and have measurable progress, right? If I'm just looking at a full website and I'm like, do website today, I'm probably going to get demotivated pretty quickly. So I will work on a couple of projects in the morning. I'll take a break for lunch. I'll come back. And in the afternoon, the morning is my most productive time. I'm a morning person for sure. So in the afternoon, I'm usually a little bit sluggish. I'll, I'll maybe read a couple more blogs or I'll plan out some of the other things that I know I have to be working on. And if I get a second wind, I'll work on some more of those projects in the afternoon. So Joe, so you're sort of living the dream, right? So you've been doing this for a few years. I mean, actually many years, you are sort of a professional expert at that. And now you're teaching others. So that's, that's, an, that's a great position to be in. So you're, you're wearing multiple hats. For all the things that you mentioned, what are the top two or three things that you really enjoy over the others? Or you, you would love, you would do it over and over again compared to the other stuff? To be honest, podcasting is probably my favorite part of my day. I'm an extrovert for sure. I work from home for myself, so I don't get a lot of interpersonal interaction throughout the day, except for when I'm doing my podcast. So I get to talk to a lot of people, and I, I just really love having those conversations and, and asking people questions and learning from them. So that's probably my favorite part. But if we're talking about the coding aspect, man, I love I, I get a bunch of different ideas. I'm primarily a WordPress developer, so it's usually plugin ideas I have. And I love sketching those out and then starting to write the code. Getting started is maybe the hard part for me, but as soon as I get the first working prototype, I'm all about it. And honestly, I can fall into a rabbit hole of if I'm working on a personal project and I'm really into it, I can do that for just like several hours at a time until my wife is like, hey, are you ever going to come down and like see other people? And, you know, she kind of needs to remind me, hey, you've been working for a really long time and it's kind of late now. So I think if I were to distill it into like one sentence, my favorite part is solving problems with code. So let me ask you this on the flip side. Are there tasks that you don't enjoy or find challenging that you, that you don't necessarily, it's, it's low on the list for you in terms of enjoyment? Yeah, starting a project is always really hard for me. It always takes a lot of mental inertia to take that first step. And even though it's a lot of kind of minutia stuff that I could probably automate, it's just writing that first line. I like the sketching out part and like the writing the feature set. And then to some extent, planning it out. I have a master's in software engineering. So like, the software planning part is something that's been ingrained to me over about six years in college. But writing that first line of code is just such a hard first step for me. I'll finish the planning. I'll go on Facebook or Twitter. I'll go back to my code editor. I'll start to write something. And then I'll just like do that cycle over. But once I get that first line down, I'm, 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 I'm good to go. So what do you mean? In your case, you have a sort of an uh, unconventional career path. You started on your own, you built it like a business. 
Is that typical? Are there situations where a front-end developer just works for one company and uh, they're just creating, they're developing for that one particular company? Is, is that, I'm assuming that is typical. The most common path for a lot of, especially young, maybe like millennial developers, mm-hmm. is work for a company for a few years and then move to another company. You know, and my dad, he worked at Verizon. Well, he worked at, I think it was Pacific next to, uh, it was New York Tel for a while and then some Bell Atlantic and then Verizon. He worked at that same company for 30 something years. But today, I think especially, well, maybe not especially, but in the development field, I've noticed that we do jump careers a lot. The best advice that I never took in college, because I knew I wanted to start my own business and I had done it, I freelanced basically from high school until until I graduated college and, and a little bit after college, full time. But the best advice I never took was when you graduate, get a job at a company for a few years, learn how industry professionals work, build your network, and then start your company. And I was 21, 22, so I was like, I don't need to do that. I already know everything I need to know. You know how young adults are. And so I started my own business. And then by the time I turned 24, or maybe it was 26, maybe the Affordable Care Act, I kicked in at that point. I realized, oh man, I'm running a business basically out of my parents' basement. I don't have health insurance soon. So I actually did get a job with my alma mater in the IT department. I stayed there for three or four years. And then I got a job at an agency and I worked there for three or four years. And then I went out on my own. And at that point, I realized that the advice I got when I was 22 was definitely advice I should have definitely taken at 22. Yeah, I mean, it's a good segue. A note I wanted to say is I've read this, you know, we all hear about uh, 95% of the businesses fail in the first five year. But I also, I was listening to a tape by Brian Tracy, a self-help a motivational author, and he says 90% of the companies started by very good employees succeed. Meaning if someone has worked for a company, they've spent, they've learned the skills, they've really done really well. Now they, can, they, they, now they have the industry expertise to go start a business and the likelihood of success is very high. And it's very similar. I mean, I'm on a similar path as well. So I can totally relate to that. I just thought I should quickly comment on what he said. Going back to what he just said. So you spoke about how today's millennials, uh, how they work and where they work. Like if someone is already thinking about becoming a front-end developer and they want to get started, what do you recommend as a good path to get started in this field? That's a great question. And it's changed considerably over the last few years. I think the best thing that you can do is sign up for a GitHub account and sign up for a CodePen account. So that's GitHub, G-I-T-H-U-B dot com and CodePen, that's CodePen.io. And those two places will allow you to write code. CodePen especially is great. It lets you write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript live in your browser so you can see the changes you're making as you're doing them. I think that's absolutely incredible. But you can also look at other people's projects and learn code. And the reason I'm telling you to do that is because more and more lately when you go for a job interview, interviewers are less concerned with your grades, your GPA, the stuff that you did in college, the things that you say you have experience in. They want to see what you've built. So if you have even just a couple of side projects, a couple of things that you've worked on on GitHub and on CodePen, you're showing your work at that point. As far as if you're starting at like ground zero, you're just deciding like at this moment, I want to be a front-end developer. Where do I start? HTML and CSS is where you start. Everything else changes really rapidly. And like HTML and CSS does too, but those are staples of the web. There's a book by John Duckett called HTML and CSS that I use in my intro class. And I think it's absolutely excellent. And then from there, I think the best thing you can learn is JavaScript. And similarly, John Duckett has a JavaScript book as well. Does someone need a degree or certification to get started in front-end development? No. I used to think yes. I was like, going to college was the best thing for me. And I still think that's true. It was the best thing for me. But 
fewer company, or I guess I should say more and more companies are losing the requirement for a formal degree. Because again, they want to see what you can do. And quite frankly, the things that I learned in the classroom at college were things like how to learn how to program. I learned Java when I was in college, and I haven't written Java since the day I graduated. I'm self-taught with HTML, CSS, PHP, and JavaScript. So the four languages that I write in today are not languages that I learned in college or not languages I learned from a formal education. The best thing I learned at college was how to program. But today, there's, I mean, there's numerous online resources. I've got courses on HTML, CSS, PHP, and WordPress development. So if you want to learn how to become a WordPress theme developer, I have you covered. There's also lynda.com and Udemy and Skillshare. There's all these places where you can take video courses. And if they're doing it the right way, you'll be able to interact with the instructor as well. So what I'm hearing is because of the internet, there's no shortage of opportunities for you to learn and get started, right? Absolutely. But, but, but you, and I'll make sure to add that, all these links. I just want to, but you talked a lot about learning, but how do they apply? Do they go and apply? Then once they learn the courses, they just go and apply for jobs. Now they have the, the certification or uh, do they, do you recommend them doing some type of freelance work before they can apply for a big company? That's a great question too. I mean, if you can get paid to learn, that's absolutely fantastic. I did that. And I'm not saying, I'm, I'm probably making it sound easier than it actually is, but you probably know somebody who needs a website. So just go up to them and be like, hey, I'm learning how to make websites. If you need a website and you don't need a lot of guidance or, or you don't need a super professional person helping you, I'd love to do that for you. Build your portfolio. But even if you don't do that or you're not comfortable doing that, most of the courses you're taking are going to guide you through a project. And you can take that project and then put it on your GitHub account or on your CodePen account. So I think the most important thing, even if you're not working on specifically client projects, is building a small portfolio of things on GitHub or CodePen to show potential employers. And when you apply, you're still going to want to have a resume, but make sure to link to your GitHub account or your CodePen account. That's solid advice. So essentially, when you, let's say you have done a free of these websites for free, when you go and approach an employer, they, you know, they act, they've actually seen some work, right? And I think the good thing about a website development is you can, that it's easy to show your portfolio and then it shows that you have ex experience and it makes you getting hired easy. Yes. And the other thing it really shows is that you are willing to learn because Here's another like maybe dirty little secret about college and applying for jobs. I, I kind of said this earlier, but whatever you learn in college is barely going to be applicable in your first job. A employer who's hiring you for an entry level position is making sure that you are flexible enough to learn the way they do things. So if you see an entry level job and it's for PHP and you only know JavaScript, actually it's probably going to be the other way around. So it's for JavaScript and you only know PHP. Take a quick course on PHP, apply for the job at the same time, you know, apply for the job and then start learning JavaScript. And during your interview say, hey, I'm not a JavaScript expert, but I'm willing to learn. And here's the stuff that I'm working on to show you that. So th that's great advice again. So let's say someone gets started, Joe, what is it? What does the career path look like? Where can the career and front-end development take them? That is a really interesting question and one that I've maybe struggled with because both times I left my jobs. So again, I had, I freelanced for a little bit after college and then I got a job at my alma mater. And the reason I left the job at my alma mater is because I felt that my skills were stagnating, but also I knew that there was very little upward mobility for me. I'd become a developer, so I was like a junior developer. I essentially became the senior web developer. So maybe that's the first career move, and that's, you don't need a promotion for that. 
essentially, or you don't need to apply for that promotion. They just, once you get to a certain skill level, maybe you can manage projects a little bit better. But I knew I was never going to be like the assistant director or the director of the department because my bosses were still relatively young. And so I'd have to wait for one of them to either quit or retire. And, you know, I wanted to start a family and make more than, you know, basically the minimum that I could make in my job. And I should also say that, you know, working at a university is you're probably going to make less than you would in the private sector anyway. They generally make up for it in benefits, but that's just something to note. Then when I left the university, I got a job at a WordPress specific agency. And so I got a nice pay raise, I was, and then, but I was kind of starting at like junior developer again. And there I worked my way up over the course of a few years. I became a junior developer and then I became a senior front-end developer. And if I had stayed, I would have become like the lead senior front-end developer. And actually, by the time I left, I became a team lead, right? So that's maybe more representative of the career path, right? So you start as a developer or a junior developer you're learning from a senior developer. You have the least amount of responsibilities there. Your job is basically make sure what you're doing is good and asking the senior developer questions. A lot of people are afraid to ask questions when they first get a job, questions as possible. You will not be penalized for that. Or if you are, you're not working at a good place. It's expected that junior developers don't know as much and should be asking questions. When you become a senior developer, now you're providing guidance you can absolutely still ask questions when you get stuck you absolutely should but now you're providing some guidance and then when i became a team lead i was managing projects and other developers so i'd work with our project manager and she would say these are the requirements from the client i would break those requirements down into technical tasks much like what i was talking about in the beginning of the show And then I would look at my team of developers and I would say, okay, I'm going to divvy them up this way. And becoming a team lead or the senior front-end developer, the lead front-end developer, that's as high as I got. Then I kind of realized that I wasn't going to become a C-level, like a C-level employee or owner in this company. And so I knew that they could make up new jobs and more responsibility for me. But again, I kind of saw a hard ceiling. So I left and I started my own company at that point. But if you continue on that path, you can probably become a project manager or sometimes you'll be called like a software architect where you get very high level and you're barely doing any code day to day, but you are architecting, putting together the projects and the requirements and you're working directly with the client to do things like that. So after listening to this, Joe, if the audience wanted to reach out to you, how do they find you? The best place to find me and everything I do is my website, my personal website, casabona.org. I'm also on Twitter and other social networks as Jay Casabona. And those are probably, you know, Twitter is probably the best place to just generally reach out and, and say hello. That's, and again, that's Jay Casabona. I'll make sure to include uh, that in the show notes. Uh, as we are about to wrap up, I'm, so far, uh, you provide a lot of insightful advice here, lots of information for the audience to follow. As we wrap up, as this is the last question, any final words or any last pieces of advice that you'd love to give the audience? Yeah. uh, And I'm going to get like a little academic-y, I guess, but I went to the University of Scranton. It was a liberal arts college. And so I had to take on top of my computer science courses, I had to take things like philosophy and theology. And One of the things that was drilled into me pretty early in my college career was all about Socrates, a a, maybe one of the most well-known classical philosophers. And he always would say that, you know, he knows what he doesn't know. And I think that's a really important thing to think about in this space. So my advice to you is know that you don't know and always continue to learn because especially in this field, things do change quickly. And if you are opposed to that or you don't like learning new things often, you're going to fall behind pretty quickly. So that's an amazing piece of advice. It's a great way to wrap up. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I really enjoy talking about this stuff. Thanks, folks, for listening to yet another episode of the Career Medis podcast. I have written a brief summary of the episode with the resources and links that Joe has mentioned throughout the interview. If you enjoyed this episode and also learned something new, feel free to post a comment or review. 
if you really loved it, definitely go ahead and share this amongst your network. Until next time, this is your host, Nisar Ahmed. Thank you.